This is a courtesy announcement that the Hewlett meeting will have a delayed start time this morning.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Housing, uh, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee. It's Thursday, September 21st at 10 a.m. Oh, a little past 10 a.m., sorry. And we're going to open this meeting by calling it to order and establishing a quorum. I see my colleague is here, my vice chair. So let's start taking, or let's start by taking some roll. Vice Chairperson Sabidian. Here with apologies for a tardy arrival, Madam Chair and colleagues. Chairperson Arenas. Here. You have a quorum. Awesome. So we are going to move on to uh, public comment. And um, that's item number two for those of you who are watching us at home, the many of you who are watching us at home. Um, this is where anyone can share comments um, about anything on, not on today's agenda or the folks inside um, the chambers today. If you are in person, you can um, grab a yellow card uh, for public comment, submit it. Um, and since this is a hybrid, um, for those of you who are viewing online, please raise your virtual hand to share public. Um, we'll start with our in-person um, public comment. Peggy. We have no speakers in chambers, and we do have one virtual speaker. Wonderful. Thank you. Our first speaker is Canis Lee. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Canis Lee. I live in Evergreen in San Jose, and I'm a senior at Valley Christian High School interested in astronomy. I'd like to take this moment to talk a little bit about the night sky, because I think a lot of us overlook just how powerful it is. To me, the night sky is not just an indicator that today is ending and tomorrow will begin. It's a beautiful sight that I can be lost in for hours. And the more I lose myself, the more I realize that life is short and that compared to the stars, we're just a second in a calendar year. I'm grateful to the night sky for inspiring me and fostering my curiosity. But I'd like to say that my feelings aren't unique. The stars have inspired generations of poets, musicians, scientists, artists, and dreamers. Vincent van Gogh himself once said, for my part, I know nothing with any certainty, but that the sight of the stars makes me dream. I hope that in the future, generations can continue to marvel at space and find humility in its vastness. But currently, it's becoming apparent our ability to do so is being more and more compromised by the rapid increase in light pollution that we're facing. Light pollution is harming our ability to stargaze, but it's also more serious than that. The circadian rhythms of humans, birds, and nocturnal animals are being disrupted. And just from light pollution alone, the US is losing $3 billion a year and adding 15 million tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It's good news that a lot of this stuff is easily preventable. All it takes is more conscious lighting design. For example, something as simple as shielding the top of our street lights. I'm determined to keep the magic of the night sky alive, and I hope you'll help me in this journey of fighting light pollution. Thank you. And to the chairperson, we have two additional hands that were raised close in time to the first speaker and two later. Go ahead and take them. Our next speaker is Jashel Leeds. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. You'll have three minutes. Hello, my name is Dasha Leeds. I'm the conservation coordinator for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. Um, I'd like to echo what Kana said. Light at night can have devastating impacts on living beings across the entire spectrum of biodiversity, humans included. Um, our circadian rhythms evolved over millions of years of consistent day and night cycles. And when those cycles are disrupted, it can lead to severe consequences. In humans, research has linked circadian rhythm disruption with hormone disruption and increased risk of cancer. And in many wildlife species, light pollution can drastically affect key behaviors like foraging and migration. Um, studies in bats have shown that some are unwilling to venture into areas with even small amounts of artificial light at night. 
and migratory birds can be completely thrown off their migration flyways by sky glow. Uh, this can end in them failing to mate or dying of exhaustion or starvation. Um, birds can also be disrupted, especially by uplighting, which increases the frequency of bird strikes and confusion for them. And these are just a few examples. Cumulatively, artificial light at night can devastate ecosystems. And this is a cumulative issue. And through policy, we can decide whether or not we want to add to this problem or become part of the solution and help mitigate that. Uh, fortunately, uh, as Kana said, there are straightforward solutions um, known as dark sky policies to mitigate light pollution. Uh, some examples are using a redder color temperature bulb, uh, using shielded fixtures to prevent light trespass, um, using shades, uh, motion sensors, and avoiding light in sensitive habitat areas are important techniques. Uh, Santa Clara County's rural zoning update is a good opportunity to include straightforward, tested, and successful light pollution guidance. Jurisdictions like LA County, Cupertino, and Sunnyvale have all taken action on light pollution, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, there are many other jurisdictions I haven't listed too, and uh, we are available to collaborate and share more information on the lighting language that has been adopted by other cities and counties. 80% of the world lives under light polluted skies, and the Milky Way is hidden from more than one third of humanity. Our children deserve to grow up and dream under a starry night sky, and our wildlife deserves the peace of night that they need biologically after millions of years of evolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shani Kleinhaus. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Good morning, Supervisor Arenas and Simitian. My name is Shani Kleinhaus. I'm the environmental advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Um, a few weeks ago, Canis Lee approached us, the Audubon and the Sierra Club, asking how we can help with the issue of light pollution. And he was speaking to the choir, obviously. We've been working on this for a long time and making progress in some cities in the area, including, uh, like Dashiell said, uh, Cupertino, also Palo Alto is now starting process, Mountain View, Sunnyvale. Um, we advocated with the county for bird safety and dark sky in the past and policies or ordinances to address these issues. And we kept their promises over time to do something about light pollution and about uh, bird safety, but the ordinances are not being developed and COVID interfered and then I guess things were kind of forgotten. Uh, stuff also promised to include it in the update to the rural zoning uh, ordinance and that didn't happen. And so we didn't know about it until recently when we talked to staff and they indicated that the only way they may include it is if there was a direction from the board of supervisors to do so, a memo or something. So I think we need to realize just how devastating light is to all our eco ecological systems. There are quite a lot of studies that show that increase in breast cancer is linked to outdoor light pollution, not just what we do in our home, and how, and how light pollution disrupts ecological systems and organisms, and it affects every living thing and every ecosystem in our, on our planet, including the deep oceans. So there are a lot of resources available. There are model ordinances by the Dark Sky Association. There are ordinances by different cities. Malibu has a recent one that is very strong. Uh, some counties have uh, either uh, countywide or rural zoning ordinances, including LA County and I think Bernardino County. And our hope is that um, you will direct stuff and find a way to help the county integrate uh, controls of lighting into the rural zoning ordinance that is being updated now. Uh, so appreciate your time this morning and have a great day. Thank you. And our final speaker is Paul Soto. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Your mic is open. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, thank you for uh, doubling back on the uh, public comment. I appreciate that. Um, the Fifth Amendment states that you cannot deprive somebody of life, liberty, 
or property without just compensation. Now, the redlining documents that were produced by the city of San Jose and sanctioned by the county of Santa Clara have explicitly in there Mexicans that were deprived and redlined out of areas in the city, Rose Garden, Willow Glen specifically. So the legal argument is there. The political will though, and, and th that had generational impacts by the way. And one of the ways in which the, that generational impact began to surface, its primary symptom of redline was quantified in the landmark case. And this landmark case is on par with Mendez versus Westminster and Brown versus Board of Education. And that's Diaz versus San Jose Unified School District. It was the first time that it was ever quantified. And this had to deal with the land. It was the, it was the direct consequence of these racial covenants and discriminatory practices. Now, until we get to a point, and this is why I, I keep harping on that issue here at this committee, because we have to get to a point where that is the standard by which all other housing policies are created. One of the things, again, I'm a researcher. So when I go on these documents and I'm researching Dr. Sal Alvarez, Fred Ross, and Father Anthony Soto, and when I look in these documents, the Chicano priesthood organization, the Ch Chicano priest organization that was headed and the president was Father McEntee, the one that the building is named after. He was the president of that organization. And what he what, what the organization states clearly, housing issues, housing issues, housing issues. This is the 1970s. So there's no excuse. We know what the problem is. It's rooted there. And so I think we need to start having a quantification of who has lived here in this city, in this county, via survey that identifies themselves as Chicanos, because it's that group of people that has experienced that generational consequence of that deprivation of property. And that concludes our speakers. Great, thank you so much. We are going to move on to item number three, which is approving um, the consent calendar. And in the moment, uh, the consent calendar um, has items 12 through 22. Um, Vice Chair Simidian, do you have any changes to the consent calendar? No, Madam Chair, I do not. I would be happy. I do have one question, if I may. Um, but I'd be happy to move approval of the consent calendar as contained in our published agenda if that works for you. Absolutely. <clears throat> then uh, I will make that motion, and if there is a second, I have just I one quick I will second that. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, question I have, and if uh, it's something staff wants to uh, circle back on a little bit later in the meeting, uh, that's certainly understandable. Um, the uh, I'm looking at item number 12, dealing with the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act program, which is a mouthful uh, and a challenge. And I just wondered uh, what the staff uh, could tell us about the status of the reclamation plan amendment that has been submitted by the folks at Lehigh, uh, whether that uh, document has been deemed complete or where we are in the process. And through the chair, if Ms. Anshano can help there. And if, as I say, if I've caught staff off guard a little bit, happy to get an answer back later in the meeting if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Absolutely, let me check and see if staff is ready to respond, it sounds like they are. <clears throat> through the, through the yes. chair, the application as I understand it from staff is incomplete and the incomplete letter is being prepared to go out. Got it, and um, any notion on how long it typically takes? I, I'm guessing staff can't really judge what somebody else will do, but uh, does that mean it's likely to be deemed, do we know if that means it's likely to be deemed complete in the next week, next month, next year? 
We, we can't say at this time because the incomplete, I don't have the list of the incomplete items, but I do know from staff that um, they're preparing to send out the incomplete letter. Madam Chair, um, this is a high interest item in some parts of the county. Uh, and uh, the planning department, to its credit, has upgraded its website on uh, this topic uh, in past years. Um, through the chair, I wonder if uh, Ms. Anshano, is there any reason we couldn't put the incomplete letter up on the website to make sure the public has access to it? I believe there's no problem with putting that on the website. It's public information once it's been sent out, sir. Then I will simply make that request. But again, the motion is to approve the consent calendar. Uh, as contained in our published agenda, Madam Chair, and thank you for the leeway to ask my question. Thank you. Um, so I will <clears throat> check to see if we have any speakers. We have no speakers in chambers, and we do have one virtual speaker, Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute, and you will have two minutes to speak. Your mic is open, thank sir. You, Paul, uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I wanted to, uh, you talked about, well, in the in the agenda, it states that the Parks and Recreation, uh, something about competitive grants. And within the context of racial equity and the principles of racial equity, we have to start institutionalizing that. And I'm going to be pressing on that because it has to be. In this era of gentrification, there's going to be a lot of people that are gonna be, um, because of the economics, they're gonna be leaving here. And with them is going to go that legacy that's rooted in Sasiquedes and that's rooted in all of the uh, social justice movements that arose from there and political movements. The farm workers movement, the low rider movement and the Chicano movement all have their beginnings in South Sea Puedes. The reason why I'm saying that about parks and what it has to do with parks is how you park. And so I'm hoping that I can get some cooperation from this committee in supporting uh, a racial equity um, component of my work. And that is having how your park designated as a historical landmark because of the lowrider history that's associated with it the first issues of Lowrider Magazine were shot at that park. And there's proof of this. And so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be submitting some work um, for your examination. And I'm hoping that I can get your support because for too long, um, the Chicano and the, the Lowrider and the, the Mexicano histories, uh, they, they just haven't been given their proper respect within the context of Santa Clara County. And we're the ones that built this county. This is an agrarian economy, and we were the ones in the fields. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I can have this committee's cooperation. And that concludes our speakers. Uh, thank you. We are going to move on to our regular agenda. Apologies. Oh, can, wait a minute. We, we do a didn't. quick vote. And yes, then I also vote. have a Levine Act announcement for item number thank four. Thank you so much. Um, Vice Chairperson Simidian? Aye. Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Motion passes. And for item number four, item number four is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Sorry to impede the progress, uh, but we have just been advised that item four on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We have also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose the contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And finally, I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff 
or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I might promptly recuse myself. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Okay, so I think we can now uh, turn it over to our Consumer Environmental Protection Agency uh, staff members, and we're ready to hear that presentation. Good morning, Madam Chair Arenas, Vice Chair Smitting. Uh, Edgar Nolasco, your agency director for SEPA. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce item four, uh, the concepts for structuring the 2025 solid waste franchise RFP. Before we start, we just I wanted to give a quick thanks to some of my colleagues, because there's a lot of work putting this together our county council's office, our the procurement department, our integrated waste division, and most importantly, um, the leadership of Deputy Executive Gallegos for helping us put this together. So I'll, no further ado, I'll introduce um, my colleagues, Vanessa Marzajedes, Program Manager 2, Michelle Young, Senior Management Analyst, and Cliff Chu, Management Analyst for SEPA. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Everybody hear me? Okay, there we go. <laughs> good morning, Chair Arenas and Vice Chair Samidian. Uh, my name is Vanessa Marcadeus, and I have my colleagues Michelle Young and Cliff Chi with us. Today we have for you a presentation, a brief presentation on the uh, county's work on the 2025 Solid Waste Franchise um, RFP. Uh, so any questions, feel free to interrupt us, or we can hold questions to the end. We'll, we'll go ahead and take the questions at the end um, and not interrupt you at all. So as a brief background on the county's current unincorporated solid waste franchise, uh, we do have residential and commercial services, which include weekly collection of garbage, recycling, and organics, which includes yard waste and food waste, extra waste and bulky goods, drop-off opportunities through events and vouchers. The current franchise term runs from July 1st, 2015 to June 2025. An anticipated new service start date for the new service would be July 1st, 2025 to 2035. This is a map of the current franchise agreement as we have it and our three uh, vendors. We have Recology, South Bay servicing the east, Green Team servicing the west, and Green Waste. We have about six, uh, 16,100 residential customers and a little over 500 commercial customers. Required unincorporated franchise agreement updates. Um, we are looking to align with the 2021 County Solid Waste Ordinance, administrative costs to cover staff and program costs, compliance with the 2023 CARB Clean Fleets Regulation, and the addition of auto enrollment requirements for mandatory collection. And opportunities for enhancements of services through the RFP, the county uh, will continue to maintain its early adopter status with SB 1383, which involves on-site monitoring required for residential and commercial customers, additional funding for required food recovery program and compost procurement, streamlining mandatory service compliance, including monitoring, education, and auto enrollment, Efficiencies by awarding no more than two districts to one hauler, so proposals will be reviewed for recommendation to the board in June of 2024. Improved service compliance, which will increase liquidated damages for customer service hold and response times, and an updated analysis of service conditions such as private roads. A little bit more about SP 1383 compliance requirements. So the county solid waste ordinance was updated in 2021 um, the SB 1383 is mandatory collection or, of organics, removing organics from the landfill. This includes route, route monitoring and enforcement, uh, outreach and education requirements and state reporting, county purchase of recycled organic materials such as compost and mulch. And we also have the county edible food ordinance created in 2021. Um, this includes edible food donation requirements for large scale generators. Uh, which encompass grocery, cafeteria, and restaurants over 10,000 square feet or 200 seats. I do want to note that there will be no impact on franchise agreement um, for compliance with SB 1383, only to administrative costs. This is a matrix that is uh, provided in the uh, legislative file. This is the current services for residential by service district. We have weekly garbage collection, recycling, and organics. Uh, annual extra waste collections, 
drop-off events, bulky, way, uh, bulky goods collection, annual yard waste vouchers, and um, bins for county use. So this is broken down by district east, west, and south. Uh, customer feedback is extremely important as we develop the RFP. Uh, we are in regular direct communication with customers through our haulers. Uh, this uh, involves an annual outreach plan, which we call a PIOP, a public education and outreach plan that we regularly meet with our haulers. A multilingual outreach and customer service. Uh, our 2022 survey does show a strong satisfaction with our current services. So we have 6,466 surveys sent to randomly selected customers. 1,233 surveys were completed and responses from all service districts were received, which is about 19% of all service districts. And 84% of respondents rated our service excellent or good. Uh, we will have tailored outreach and form service recommendations for the RFP. Um, we had online focus groups held in May 2023 and direct phone service to customers. Uh, phone surveys, excuse me. So one priority of the RFP is to keep rates low. Um, these are a list of our strategies to do that. Staff is recommending a 10-year agreement which will allow haulers to amortize costs and propose the lowest rates. Uh, haulers can propose on multiple districts which will provide cost savings options that staff can analyze. Pricing for optional hauler services will also allow comparison with county costs. Um, this could be in the case of route monitoring and procurement of compost and mulch. Proposal rates for on-call emergency services and to secure prices if those services are needed. And this includes disaster debris cleanup bins and availability of collection vehicles. We will maintain the current rate structure of increased rates as garbage cart size increases. Uh, this creates an incentive for diversion of maximum output, uh, maximum amount of recyclable and compostable material. Customers will get the lowest rates based on incremental increases in hauler costs of service. And this creates a market mechanism uh, to encourage downsizing to the small service for customer needs. Industry, industry standard wage um, is being prioritized by the county to assure reasonable wages for drivers and uninterrupted service to customers. Wages must be negotiated under collective bargaining agreement or not less than the general living rate of per diem wages benefits paid in Santa Clara County for similar work. Uh, staff does implement an annual process to survey waste management contractors and facilities to develop average driver wages. Worker retention is a key priority of the RFP. Uh, the RFP will ensure that terminated contractor workers have a transition period. Uh, this includes confirming ongoing employment, obtaining new employment, and the grantee will retain workers from terminated contractor for 90 days and only termination for cause. After 90 days, grantee will provide written performance and consider continued employment. Uh, this is a tentative schedule of the current RFP process uh, presenting to Hewlett today and a tentative date of presenting to the Board of Supervisors on October 3rd. Release of the RFP in November, December 2023. Proposal submission in March 2024. Evaluation and selection of finalists in July 2024. Board approving the notice of intent to award. This is also going to be the time that a uh, transition planning will also begin, September 2024. Through the uh, chair, excuse the interruption. Is this a question? Quick question. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm holding questions until the very end. Uh, All right. Vice chair. Um, I'm only interrupting because I don't see page numbers on this, but I can track it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, execution of the agreement in January 2025 and service start date in July 2025. Uh, that concludes staff's presentation, and we're happy to answer questions. How can we help you sort this out? Uh, I'm good, thanks. I, right. I'm, I'm just remembering the constant exhortation from our former colleague, Supervisor Wasserman, for page numbers, but I, I, I got it uh, not to. Supervisor, sorry. I did have that discussion with staff. They, they talked to us this morning. Sorry, thanks. Supervisor. No, 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 it's a, it, this is manageable. It's a, that's, if that's the biggest problem we face as a county in this year, it'll be a great year. And, and that is the biggest problem we have. Oh my through, gosh! Through um, through the chair, if I may. So 
sir, go ahead. Um, on this screen, uh, just it's just a language issue. Which one of these is the Board of Supervisors votes to award the contracts? I've got events one through eight. Which one of these is five members of the board will be sitting up here, we'll have a, something in our uh, packet, and we'll have to award the contracts? That would be item number six, September 2024. Uh, board approves notice of intent to award. Okay, so the notice of intent. And I, I don't, I genuinely don't have an opinion, Madam Chair, uh, whether that may be, but um, you know, I, it strikes me that that's just a few months before we have two new board members coming on board. I don't, uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just uh, suggesting that somebody give it a little bit of thought, uh, and maybe you already have, and if so, I'd be happy to hear from staff if, if it's like, that's when it is, so that's when it is, and the other is not relevant, or gee, maybe we should wait, or no, we should get it wrapped up so it's not on the to-do list. I'd so supervisor submitting, Sylvia Geigas, Deputy County Executive, um, we did consider this, and to avoid a disruption in service, um, which with the term of the current agreements ending June 2025, our thought was that when we learned who the new supervisors are early in 2025 that we would bring this up as one of obviously the major considerations and that the prior board you know presumably if it does approve the agreements you know took this action and and give them a briefing and obviously work with all board offices before that transition as we as we do typically to ensure that you know you have the communication with your constituents and that when we have complaints that we can work uh, collaboratively with with the various offices. Thank you. Uh, further questions, if I may, through the chair, or I'm happy to defer to you, Madam Chair, forgive me. I just wanted to ask that one question, but I do have some others. It, th thank you, and well, I'm gonna check in with our clerk to see if there's any members of the public who'd like to speak on this item. We have no speakers in chambers and currently no hands raised in Zoom. Well, that is a surprise. Okay, well, I'm gonna go back to my vice chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, uh, I went through this once before, uh, and I can't remember how many years it's been. When did we, 10 years ago? Yeah, and um, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, and uh, candidly, there were some challenges 10 years ago, uh, and I see some uh, heads nodding in recollection. Uh, I do have some questions and some comments. The uh, first, the question is about, um, I guess it's SB 1383, regulating organics. Um, and can, could staff give at least me a refresher on what that entails? I, um, my recollection is that uh, it's fairly prescriptive in terms of what is supposed to be in which container and then an inspection protocol and a notice protocol and an enforcement protocol. And as you can perhaps tell from the tone of my question, I've got some concerns about all that, but first I'd like to hear just a, a reminder or a refresher on how all that is supposed to work. Thank you, um, thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Michelle Young, Integrated Waste Management. So um, under 1383, there are several requirements related to organics diversion. It is a climate bill, so the main goal of the law is to remove organics from the landfill where they create methane. So the law is very prescriptive about removing organics from the garbage going to the landfill, which would mean yard waste or food waste. So the law is prescriptive on which containers uh, contain which materials, and we are required to go into the um, routes and look into containers to um, identify whether residents are sorting correctly and provide outreach and education to them. Ultimately, our ordinance does allow for notices of violation to residents or businesses, but our strategy is to focus on outreach and education and working with the customers to help them understand the importance of the law and how they can best sort their materials. Thank you, and have we, um, if there's an enforcement action, does someone in effect get a ticket? An infraction notice? They, they, they can't. That, that part of our enforcement plan is, is not built out yet, but the ordinance does allow that. And have we ever given it such a ticket? No. Okay. Um, 
let me see if I have any other questions before I move to comments. Um, well, thank you for the clarity about the date, and I'm just, uh, as I said, as, as long as the date is selected sort of intentionally with, you know, sort of deliberate purpose and understanding of the timeline, I, I don't have a concern about the timeline at all. I will say this, um, if there are any, well, first, I, I think I have a, uh, and maybe it's just that I see the glass half empty, but 84% may sound like a good number in terms of customer satisfaction. I, I actually think if 16% of folks don't think their garbage is being picked up in an either good or excellent way, that's not a happy outcome. This is a, this is a basic service. This is kind of local government 101. I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying there aren't challenges. I'm just saying, you know, picking up the garbage uh, is kind of a basic uh, service. And I think 16% is actually a relatively high number. So I'd like to ask through the chair and uh, that when you come back to the board, the full board, that uh, you offer up some thinking, some strategies about how to how to get those numbers up, not by happy talk or inflating the numbers, but you know, like what what would it really say? You know, if 15% um, uh, of a group of folks said, I think, Joe, you're doing a fair or worse job, I wouldn't think that was a happy moment. So I just, uh, I wanna sort of lean in on that, both for staff, but also so you can let the vendors know that that's the reaction of the awarding agency. Uh, and uh, if we need to build in some, uh, incentives or penalties, uh, carrots or sticks, I, I'm open to that, but I think that number should be higher. Uh, that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is uh, I appreciate the staff's um, focus on education rather than enforcement uh, on the organics. I um, was privileged to serve in the state legislature following um, an extraordinary uh, legislator named Byron Schur, who is the uh, father, grandfather, grandparent, whatever, of our California recycling uh, program, as I can see the staff knows that uh, Byron's a bit of a sort of a legend in his own time, literally. Um, but, um, and I, you know, chaired the Senate Environmental Quality Committee where we dealt with these issues uh, for seven years of my time in Sacramento. Um, and I certainly take the climate uh, implications seriously. But I have a um, I have a view of how we affect change, which is keep it simple. If you want people to do something, make it easy for them to do it. Um, I get comments from real people who, you know, uh, as one gentleman put it to me, it's like, hey, you know, it's gotten to the point where I feel like I have to gift wrap my garbage in order to get it picked up. Um, I, candidly, I thought he had a point. Um, and, um, you know, part of it is that the criteria keep changing. Uh, part of it is that they're not, frankly, all that simple. Uh, and um, I think we need to be realistic about what we can expect of people. And I want to underscore your education first rather than enforcement approach. That um, there are times when, you know, I might lean in and say, nope, if enforcement's what it takes, then let's go. But on, on something like this, I just really think. Um, a light touch is to be called for. So let me cross that one off. Um, the one other thing I would, uh, would say is, um, when we did this 10 years ago, Ms. Gallegos will recall, we were given assurances at the time of transition that everything was good to go. Uh, and because it was uh, June, July transition, Madam Chair, the transition took place while our board was on recess. And I will just say that uh, when we came back from recess, we had a lot of unhappy folks. Uh, and, um, uh, and their unhappiness made some members of the board, myself included, unhappy. And we shared that unhappiness with staff. And there was, frankly, a lot of cleanup to do. But what was particularly disconcerting was, you know, to staff's point about the timing, we knew the transition was coming. We had asked very specifically, everybody squared away. We had been given reassurances that everybody was squared away, both at our staff level, but more ground level, the companies who had been contracted with. And it turned out pretty clearly that they weren't. 
So I would just ask staff to work with the contractors to make sure that no, really, they are ready, okay? That the, when the transition comes along, um, that, that people really have, so if they need to do test drives down the routes or if they need to do more outreach to the community. Um, and, you know, look, I, I'm sure that a lot of customers pay no attention until there's a problem. That's just human nature. If that means we have to work a little harder or the contractors have to work a little harder to say, you know, it's going to be this way now, it used to be that way, um, I think our not too distant history tells us that that's uh, probably what we're going to need to see. So um, that is uh, my feedback today. Um, Madam Chair, do we anticipate much in the way of, uh, I think part of the challenge the last time was that there was in fact some change in areas of responsibility or the district coverage or whatever. Do we, are we anticipating that or are we thinking that the map that you showed us is going to stay more or less the same? To answer your question, your memory is correct that we did change districts last time and, you know, it was my goal to reduce it to three districts by geographic area and we plan to stick with these same districts. Thank you. I think that may help minimize some of the challenge. Last uh, observation is, uh, and Ms. Gallegos and I seem to, you know, be the members of this alumni club. Um, for, the, uh, I also had concerns at the time uh, about potential cost increases over the life of the contract. And um, uh, if I remember uh, correctly, uh, the, uh, the West area w had a slightly different contract as a result with respect to um, cost and potential cost increases over time. I would ask that um, staff be mindful of those concerns as well, that, that the potential for inflation. When, you know, we got, and I, forgive me, I forgot the term of art, when we got the um, staff memo saying that by virtue of the declining recycles market, recyclables market around the globe, that we had to accommodate some, understood, you know, the, but I, I do want to make sure we protect our, uh, our, our rate payers, fee payers, whatever we properly call them, the customers, our constituents from um, exorbitant hikes in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your latitude on all that. Uh, thank you. Um, I also have a couple of questions and comments, and I really appreciate you um, bringing up the satisfaction um, piece of this, uh, Vice Chair, as I think it's important um, for our residents um, to be content with some basic services, and you're absolutely right. This is absolutely basic. Um, I do think, though, that there was... Um, some mitigation of, of some of the responses um, by staff in the way that they uh, responded to and rec made recommendations um, for the new RFP, which I'm, I'm happy about. Um, and I think that, that hopefully we will get to, um, you know, could we say 95%? I'm not putting that in a motion anywhere, but Hopefully we, we, we get into the 90s. And I, I actually think that, that we could strive for that because it was a very thoughtful recommendations in terms of, of, uh, of listening to our constituents um, and then making recommendations in terms of, of what we would ask in this new RFP um, for folks, uh, for these proposers uh, or uh, folks who are proposing within this RFP to do, um, and I appreciate it. I especially like the um, the cleanup, the big bulk, right? Everybody, everybody is always asking about that. Um, and no matter where you live or how clean you think you are, there's always something in your garage that um, you're keeping for whatever sentimental or whatever reason, it's too heavy. Um, and it makes it so much easier when you can just haul it down the street. So I, I really appreciate um, all of the, the responsiveness of the staff. I, I think that it was, it was really listening to our constituents and then forming this RFP so that we can um, achieve better, not only just satisfaction rates, but just be more effective in um, serving our public. Um, one of the things, and, 
And I agree, I think recycling and garbage is, I'm gonna say it, it's messy. <laughs> bum -bum -bum. <laughs> and um, and uh, over at the city of San Jose, I know that we, you know, we, are, are, we have a lot larger in terms of our uh, customers. Um, and one of the top priorities that I had there was to take a look at how um, those uh, folks who are servicing our, our customers are also paying their employees and their workers, right? And there was a lot of work on haulers um, and actually um, because those are the, the companies that come in and actually pick up our garbage, but then they also take this garbage. Um, and to your point, Vice Chair, um, not everybody knows how to separate organics from recyclables with the rest of uh, the garbage. Um, and so we have sorters at all of these facilities, um, yet our contracts are with the haulers, if you will. So um, one of the things that, that I made sure to hold um, uh, our recycling and, um, and garbage contractors is to living wages for our sorters, even though our contract isn't with the sorters, it's with the haulers. And so one of the things that, that I'm hoping that we can do is um, think about this and, and how do we also uh, make sure that those folks who are keeping us, I, I'm gonna be so corny this morning, clean, <laughs> um, our nose is clean with um, SB 1383, how are they getting compensated, right? And so if you could please just tell me what the wage, wage requirements are for those um, those workers. Okay, thank you. Th thank you, Supervisor Arenas, Michelle Young, Integrated Waste. So, um, as you know from our um, ledge file and our slide packet, uh, the current franchise and the proposed RFP focused first on drivers um, with the industry standard wage provision. Um, but since uh, we have learned a lot more about San Jose's modified living wage, um, through your offices and, and meetings with your staff, which has been very helpful. We have shifted that focus and, and are looking at uh, what are primarily subcontracts. So as you say, we have collection contracts with the grantee, and in most cases, they're gonna subcontract for that work, so the employees are not their direct um, uh, employees. Uh, but we are looking at a strategy that we would like to bring back at the October 3rd board meeting um, where we could uh, demonstrate our commitment to those uh, sorter wages. And so uh, we are looking at um, all the cities in the county and what their strategies are. And we, again, have spent a lot of time looking at the San Jose modified living wage to see if we can um, come up with a, a strategy that would show that support in the short term, um, we are benefiting from the fact that San Jose has the modified living wage, which is paid to all the sorters that handle our material. So the unincorporated contract brings up less than 1% of the material to the material recovery facility that is handled by any sorter. So it's difficult for us to leverage the small number of rate payers that we have to lift the wages above that but we would like to require in the RFP and in the contracts that all the proposers have a commensurate wage for the sorters so that nobody is looking for a lower rate than the relatively high average rates, rates that we have in Santa Clara County. So Santa Clara County is much higher than the California um, standard rate of $15. We're at a, averaging around $24 for sorters in Santa Clara County. So we are in a good, um, worker environment in terms of those standard wages, but we would like to codify that in the RFP and in the contract so that we're, we're um, showing that commitment and making sure that regardless of the activities of any of the other cities, including San Jose, that we have put that into our contracts to 
uh, make sure that we get that assurance from the grantee. If I may, Madam Chair, I just want to add, um, these are ideas that we're thinking about and brainstorming at this time. We're not prepared to sure. go in any direction. We still need to convey with county council on how mm -hmm. we can best go forward, but um, we, um, we appreciate the comments. Uh, thank you, and um, I appreciate that you appreciate um, our sorters. Um, and I know many of you here probably have already taken tours and understand what that process looks like, but if you haven't, you'll understand why I'm advocating so deeply for our sorters. It is a very difficult job. I can't imagine yeah. somebody would be being paid $15 so, an hour. Madam Chair, um, if I could just may... Excuse uh, me. Uh, Hold on one second. So so I know that... that um, that this is something that you all care about and that you are listening, and I want, and I'm, I really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and I want to make sure that I, that I keep this rather open in terms of what these options may look like. I hear you loud and clear, not ready to, to declare exactly how. I know that um, we've discussed um, some sort of evaluation credit um, for RFPs, which is maybe something that you were allu alluding to, or maybe a sorter wage scale, similar to the one that um, is in the city of San Jose. Um, these are all just ideas. We have to work with something that um, works for our, our county, right, and our system. We, I understand that we don't have the same number of customers. Um, but, but I do want us to stay on this and make sure that we, we have something. Um, the, the other piece on this is, uh, and, and I hear you, Vice Chair, about uh, making sure that our future board um, has a say in, in the future <laughs> um, and are not bound by, by past council uh, board members. I'm thinking of my own experience um, as a council member and votes I took and how new council um, uh, is bound by some of the votes that we have, and so I'm open to 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 looking at that at that timeline um, as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm considerate of that. Um, um, but before I make a motion, um, because I would like to um, direct our administration to explore options in developing living wage rules for sorters and bringing that back to the the greater board. I do want to hear your comments, um, Sarah, so if you would please share. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to share that um, sorters at the Green Waste facility, which all of our recycling goes to, do have a starting salary of $22 at this time. Thank you. Um, thank you. I know I said 15. 15, 22, anything under 50, my goodness. And I know I'm not going to say that we are going to start at 50, but I've seen that. I, that sorting is, I mean, that's God's work right there because we are not careful in, in the way that we throw our trash into our bins. We just don't think about who's going to receive that at the other end and have to sort all of our mess out. And so, you know, um, they, they perform a very um, important job and I wanted to be, um, have, to have them the kind of wage that dignifies the work that they're doing. Um, I see my vice chair is positioned to maybe make a comment. Oh, and I see his light. Yes, go ahead, vice chair. Well, I wanted first to second your motion, um, Madam Chair, and then I do have one more issue to follow up if this is the time, but I don't want to. Sure, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> this may be a moot point uh, given the a indication that uh, we're not anticipating a lot of change in the geography uh, or the territory, but um, it's all coming back to me now, uh, all these years later, that part of the challenge, I think, was that, um, and I suspect this is not unique to my district. It may be you know, specifically challenging in my district, but I think, Supervisor Arenas, I don't know your district as well, obviously, but. Um, in areas that were particularly rural or mountainous, um, I remember part of the challenge was, if I remember correctly, was that 
the contractors literally did not have trucks that were smaller and that could get down some of these private roads or uh, older roads that weren't built to 21st century standards or expectations. And again, it's maybe a moot point if the geography is not going to change significantly, but that's a knowable thing. So I guess I would just yeah. encourage the, the staff to make sure that anyone who is bidding on a property is obliged to say, and by the way, we have the equipment that is necessary to um, serve that uh, that region because not not you know our, our districts have very diverse topography uh, and you know some of them have uh, unincorporated areas that really are quite urban but others have unincorporated areas that are anything but and I'll just let it go at that thank you and again I'll second the chair's motion thank you and thank you for reminding us about that it, it's so true when I, uh, the more I explore South County the more I've, I I well, one, I fall in love with, with South County, but I can appreciate some of those challenges, and definitely those roads are narrow and, and difficult to maneuver. Um, Sylvia, go ahead. I actually want to respond to an earlier comment that you had made, mm -hmm. um, which was your expression of concern as supervisor submitting with respect to new to new incoming board members. The only other option in my mind um, other than following this specific schedule, if that is a, a, a concern, would be possibly to execute, you know, a one-year extension of current agreements that would then time, you know, the next one, uh, the next RFP with the involvement of the new board. So that's obviously the board's decision. But absent that, I'm not sure there's any other options to change the timing on the current schedule that we presented to the board. Or to the committee. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Um, and you know, we can make this at the at the decisions at the at the like you said at the at the board larger board. Um, but f and I, I appreciate that. I don't want the disruption. I heard you say, um, Vice Chair, um, even with just the transition, there was a lot of issues, and so any stop in service would be a huge concern for me. Um, we have to learn from our, our mistakes, or, or maybe not just mistakes, but just lessons learned, right? And so we have to uh, figure out what the best approach is for the next um, 10 years that we're going to have this, this, uh, this contract. And so I'm, I'm absolutely open to hearing some of that feedback, and I appreciate it. So I'm just going to go to our clerk now for, uh, to call uh, roll for our vote. Vice Chairperson Samidian? Aye. Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. So we are just moving along. And next we have item six. This is the annual university. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, everyone. I know that this is really, really hard work, and, and I appreciate it. And thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, this item that is next is item six for those of you who are following us at home. It's annually, it's the annual University of California Cooperative Extension Program report. I'm absolutely excited to hear about this um, as, as uh, the district that has the remaining agricultural land. I'm just uh, really appreciative and so I look forward to hearing the report in the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, CIPA, Agency Director Edgar Nolasco again. I want to have my two colleagues who will be introducing this item, uh, Joe Davini, Ag Commissioner for Santa Clara County, and uh, UCCE Director for Santa Clara County, Sheila Berry. Thank you for this opportunity to highlight the work and the accomplishments of the University of California Cooperative Extension in Santa Clara County, and also really to acknowledge the valuable partnership that the university has with the county of Santa Clara, and we've had for over 50 years, which is when we signed our first agreement. We are um, housed with SEPA, the Consumer Environmental Protection Agency, both in San Jose and in San Martin. And we connect the people of Santa Clara 
to the university, bringing science-based solutions to improve health and well-being, agriculture, and natural resource management. Our uh, local organization includes academics and staff, about 20 FTE, that are funded by both by the University of California, the federal government, state grants, and the county, and we conduct applied research and extend research-based information. About half of our funding comes from uh, use University of California and county support. That's direct and in-kind with the other half coming from grants. Those are federal, state, and private grants. Every dollar invested by the county, that includes both the direct and the indirect uh, funding this past year, returned an additional $7 to serve the people of Santa Clara County, or is matched with an additional $7. And so I'm gonna share with you the programs that serve the people and also what problems we are working to resolve. So one of our most well-known programs is 4-H, youth development. And in Santa Clara, we maintain traditional 4-H clubs and also conduct 4-H programs that enhance after-school programs. And in both of these efforts, we're working to increase our reach to underserved communities and in particularly improving college readiness for Latinx teens and promoting STEM education. Our CalFresh Healthy Living is improving nutrition and health among youth through direct nutrition education and also through cafeteria promotions or tastings. Um, we also work on implementing improved practices in lunchrooms and increased physical activity in schools. CalFresh also partners with our community-based programs, master gardeners and, <coughs> sorry, master composters to improve school gardens and help kids understand the connection between nutrition and food growing for better health outcomes. Our Santa Clara Master Gardeners conduct over 265 classes, workshops, and tours last year and operate eight demonstration gardens. And they, are, they, they do this with 300 trained volunteers. They're certified as Master Gardeners. They're providing over 30,000 volunteer hours to support um, home and community gardening. Our compost education program conducts over 40 workshops a year on home composting throughout the county and also supports school composting programs. And composting is a climate smart solution to manage household food and other organic waste. In addition to these community programs, we have several other research and extension programs that work to improve ag sustainability and natural resource management. Our agriculture liaison, Julie Morris, works with county planning and the ag department and other county agencies to implement the Santa Clara Valley um, agricultural plan. Um, we supported the county's second round of ag resilience incentive grants, which, which gave 12, uh, which is supporting 12 farmers and implementing practices to improve carbon sequestration. And we are also assisting small growers to meet planning department regulations and working with property owners, county staff, and house, housing advocates to increase opportunities for farm worker housing. Um, our small farm and specialty crops program offered 32 workshops, seminars, and field trips supporting small farmers with technical assistance. Our advisor, Dr. Aparna Gazula, conducts research on peppers and Asian vegetables, which are the primary crops grown by our farmers, our small farmers, so they can comply with regional board water quality regulations. And these trainings are provided in English and Chinese and Spanish with outreach to nearly 1,500 uh, farmers in the region. The Livestock and Natural Resource Program focuses on keeping ranchers viable in the county. And these rangelands account for 40% of the county's land. Um, our rangelands are increasingly recognized for the, the value they have in supporting wildlife recreation and storing carbon. And these workshops help landowners understand how to maintain structures like this stock pond so they can continue to provide habitat for endangered species. And I'm the, uh, a livestock advisor for this program, and I recently received funding to research radical reduction of methane, 
from cattle grazing through supplementation with red seaweed, which is uh, some research that was initiated at UC Davis. The Human Wildlife Interaction Advisors conducting research on non-lethal deterrents to protect livestock from carnivores, mountain lions, and coyotes. Dr. Carolyn Witzel also has conducted numerous workshops on rodent or gopher and ground squirrel management and helps communities in Santa Clara, like uh, the villages in San Jose, learn how to manage and coexist with wildlife like, like coyotes. A newer program that we have is uh, supported by CAL FIRE is aimed at improving resilience and reducing impacts of catastrophic wildfire. The newly hired advisor, Barbara Wolfson, studies the uh, effect, eff efficacy of prescribed fire and works with tribes and state lands to increase the use of prescribed fire and other fuel treatment programs. Our urban ag and food systems program has hosted organic uh, workshops on organic farms and is, is researching cult cultural relevant crops to be grown in local community gardens. The advisor, Dr. Lucy Diekman, has also developed a website mapping urban ag farms in the Bay Area. Our urban forestry advisor, Dr. Ig Igor Lockin, conducts workshops on tree pest and drought recovery for professional tree care providers. He's also conducting research on tree performance in green stormwater infrastructure and has developed info information on tree care post fire. And then our urban integrated pest management advisor, Dr. Andrew Sutherland, trains pest management professionals on integrated pest management strategies, risk reduction, pesticide safety, and to protect surface water. He's working with the county's IPM program to develop trainings for pest management professionals. And in Sunnyvale, he demonstrated a uh, property-wide integrated pest management intervention at a low-income apartment where they were able to reduce the incident and density of German cockroaches. Finally, um, I want to mention that we also have a really significant partnership with another, with another county agency, Santa Clara County Parks. At Marshall, Par at Marshall Cottle Park, our master gardeners have developed a four-acre demonstration garden, which hosts workshops and plant sales. And our CalFresh brings classes to um, Marshall Cottle Park to learn about pollinators and where vegetables come from. Our urban ag is working on managing pests in our raised beds we're establishing, and our composters have developed a uh, demonstration site for composting food waste and manure um, with our 4-H, uh, and our 4-H are, are raising uh, livestock also um, at our Sunset Farm at the Marshall Cottle Park. So you see Cooperative Extension really covers a breadth of topics and our research extends throughout the county and we truly appreciate and count on our partnership with the county through SEPA and county parks to work towards our mission through, uh, which is improving the lives of all Californians. Thank you, what a wonderful presentation. I'm um, going to first uh, check in with our Clerk, to see if we have any speakers in person or online. We do not. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to. Um, good. good. Apologies. One hand did just go up on the Zoom room. If you want. Oh, to take sure. It. I'll, I'll accept it. Our next speaker is Paula Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute to begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you for that report. That was very. Uh, it was informative, comprehensive. It looks like you've been able to establish um, a lot of relationships to um, to enhance and maintain the uh, the quality of of farming and 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 the ecosystems. What I want to talk about or like ask is like, how accelerated are you in assuring that? children have access to, like say the uh, California Department of uh, Forestry in terms of training programs, instead of like, have you formed relationships with San Jose Conservation Corps 
because that's a viable uh, place of employment, CDF. Um, the other things is because you're having the offspring, the grandchildren and great grandchildren of campesinos, of Chicanos that work this land, that literally built this agricultural economy that you outlined beautifully. Well, there's a generational impact on those kids. And so, I, I, you know, it just sometimes this gets glossed over when we talk about agriculture in this context. And so I'm concerned about the great grandchildren and grandchildren that will not be able to viably sustain themselves economically here because that history is glossed over and not even referenced within the context of your report. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you. Um, now I'm gonna look to my vice chair for any comments or questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First, let me just put uh, on the record the motion to receive the report. Uh, and uh, if that's okay for a second, I do have some comments and questions. Absolutely, second. Thank you. Um, First, just a, a statement or an observation. There are five members of our board of supervisors. Some of us represent districts that are more urban, some less. Uh, and I just uh, sort of wanted to uh, reassure you and you know, say in our public setting, um, I, I do consider the agricultural component of our county economy an important component. Uh, I think there's some folks, frankly, who've given up on it. Uh, I am not one of them. Uh, and I think, uh, to its credit, our board over the years has tried to be mindful of the importance of the agricultural economy, not just as an economic driver, but in terms of the lives of families uh, in, in the county. So um, that's just a kind of a, you know, wanted to get that out there and on the record. In fact, forgive me, Madam Chair, but at one point in the California State Legislature, I represented two thirds of the nation's Brussels sprouts, uh, which, which was, yes, indeed. I love uh, and, um, I'll just let it go at that. But uh, it does lead to a question, which is um, that was in South San Mateo County on the coast side there, uh, which I know you know is um, really a, um, an important agricultural uh, venue, but which has had its struggles. How much uh, back and forth collaboration, cooperation is there? I ask this as someone who represents the northern part of Santa Clara County. So, you know, it is literally right next door. And, and in, to some extent, that boundary line is a little um, artificial in terms of crops. How much interaction do you have with your uh, counterparts in San Mateo County, if I may ask? Through the chair. Uh well, so, so we, many of our advisors are actually cross county. Okay. So like, for example, the livestock advise that not the livestock, the, the uh, wildlife human interaction advisor and our urban forestry advisor are both based in San Mateo County. So we do have quite a bit of, of uh, collaboration with um, all of our actual neighboring Bay Area counties. Um, and we also, as you note, would note from my report, have a urban footprint, you know, in terms of integrated pest management. Our pest management advisor always reminds me that he does not work on plants at all. He works, you know, in residential areas um, looking at how to better manage household pests, um, particularly those with six legs. Um, so, we have that program and also our, our forestry advisor. We're, we're actually just hiring a, um, have just hired a forestry advisor who's gonna cover San Mateo and Santa Cruz and Santa Clara County and, and working with the uh, commercial timber producers. There's you know only a couple in our county. But um, we do have Igor who does urban forestry, um, and he's, like I said, based in San Mateo County and, is, and works on some of the urban tree issues, like um, particularly the recent impacts of drought um, and how that's impacted um, tree health. I um, want to underscore the comments you made and that were in your report about 
changing crop mix, I think, um, you know, one of the things that the tragedy in San Mateo County recently underscored was that the demographics of the farm labor community are changing. They change over time, they're dynamic. Um, that has some implications for your work and the changing demographics of our county also has some uh, implications in terms of crops. Uh, and I just I sort of want to underscore the importance of that. Um, if you've got additional comments, happy to hear them uh, with the consent of the chair. But I, I mostly just sort of wanted to say that I see that at least as a sort of a two-part conversation. One is about the folks who are actually part of the farm labor workforce, and the other is about the kind of crop selection uh, that you know fits the tenor of the times and the changing demography of our county. Yeah, the, the work that um, uh, Aparna Gazula is doing, looking at the nutrient and water use, particularly of some Asian um, vegetables, is really important because uh, there's regulations that are, that are developed based on how, what these plants use, but that information doesn't exist outside of, um, of what, it, what the work that she's doing because it's not, these aren't widely grown elsewhere. And so um, we do have a, a unique situation in that we are producing some important specialty crops that are important to our region and grow here well, and also have a really diverse um, work, workforce that's also much different. I think we have the only program in the state that is um, providing work in Chinese, for example, because of the large number of Chinese growers that we have in South County. Thank you. The next question uh, is, uh, I'm going to just sort of ask you, you, you know, this is by definition a report on uh, fiscal year 22-23, but if I were to ask you, all right, looking two years out, five years out, ten years out, what's the future going to demand of you, require of you, what's the need in terms of the work uh, that you all are doing, what would you tell us? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I don't know that I have a, a, a crystal ball, but I, I, you know, obviously we are dealing with a lot of things in terms of, of, of changing climate and that is going to impact, and water use um, are things that are gonna impact agriculture. But also I think you know, we have uh, ongoing needs to continue with our programs with um, really all of our community um, in regards to our nutrition education, which we continue to, to work at. Um, and it's, uh, I, I, I see that as a continuing, um, really important need is, and, and to continue to connect um, parts of our county better with um, healthy food choices and to have better uh, education related to a better understanding of you know, how to get it and what to get. And, and how to eat it. Got it. Last question um, from me is, um, references an issue that uh, both members of this committee have uh, expressed interest in and that um, Supervisor Arenas has recently uh, been able to make some significant progress on, and that's the issue of housing stock, affordable housing stock for folks who are part of the farm labor workforce. Do you have a connection to that? topic conversation that you can share here. I'm just wondering how we can leverage. I'll take that question, Vice Chair. Um, UCC will be part of the referral given by Supervisor Arenas. They will be part on the survey process and input, and that's what their contribution is as part of this larger referral. Thank you. I think I'll st stop and uh, say thank you for the report and listen to the comments and questions from others. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll pick up where you left off, Vice Chair, um, because that is an interesting uh, role, especially since in 2018 when we last did the survey, I believe there was only farmers, or at least th those voices represented in, in that survey, and we didn't really hear from um, the farm workers, and so I'm really interested in in learning more. And um, as my vice chair was just mentioning, the composition of our agricultural workers change over time. 
I hear loud and clear um, there's a higher Asian um, uh, need and, and desire for uh, vegetables and fruits. And so that has an impact in our county and in who is growing what and, and who's working there as well, right? And so I, I wanna make sure that we're very cognizant of, of that shift as well. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear you um, recognize um, some of those changes, um, Supervisor Simidian, and, and how, and then Sheila, that we're, we're, we're making sure that we stay, keep our ear to the ground, really. Um, um, so I'm, I'm glad to, to, to learn that you're recognizing this in the ear, and that I think it's Julie that's working, right? right. Um, and I think she's done some really fabulous work with farm workers out there, and the fact that we, we are recognizing who's out there and who and what they need and providing um, grants. And I think there was, I, uh, I, I can't remember the number of grants, but at least there was $100,000 in terms of grants for some of the farmers. I think in, in um, I'm not sure in which of, of the fields, but, but um, irregardless, I just think it's wonderful that we're supporting our, our agricultural um, workforce out there, and, and and I know that our our uh, Santa Clara County Commissioner, um, Agricultural Commissioner, is here. Joe, I'm I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing as well, and I know that we have a tour soon enough, um, and so we'll get to see, I'll get to see some of this work in in person. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so I heard. You say that there was there was some language specific um, uh, either permits or, or documents that were translated into Chinese. Um, what are some of what are some of those uh, other aside from just the language um, barrier? What are some of the other um, concerns or, or needs that those growers, uh, that those farmers and the farm workers, if there's anything that you've recognized? Well, I, I would say that one of our, uh, I, I, one, of our, one of our strengths that we bring to working with our community is that we are non-regulatory. Um, but they are faced with many regulations. And so I think we have played an important role and continue to play an important role, particularly with some of our farmers who are non-English speaking, but you know, I think it's across the board in helping them understand the regulations um, and meet the re regulations. And then also in some cases, helping the regulators understand mm. um, what, the realities might be on the farm or how they apply. So I think that's a really key role that we we play and also a, a, a significant barrier um, to some in terms of of their um, operations. Got it. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, the I'm going to move a little bit away from that, I, and maybe offline we can talk a little bit about some of those specifics in terms of regulations. I'm interested in learning a little bit more about that, um, and we can have an offline conversation about that. Um, I was really um, impressed with, uh, in your slideshow, there was a Meyer Lemon three for a dollar, and I said, in what part of the Bay Area are they selling <laughs> Meyer Lemons for for dollar three of them, <laughs> nonetheless, um, and so it was just really one. I was really impressed with that. Well, where, are there a lot of um, farmers markets that that are are getting blended into this? How 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 did that picture? Uh, that was something Julie provided. I, I can't remember the background <sighs> of it, but it came from a farm stand, I believe. And, um, and that is something that is, I think, rather, I, I work in other uh, counties in the Bay Area, Alameda and Contra Costa, and I will say that I believe what we have in South County in terms of our farm stands is rather unique in terms of the number of farm stands where the f local farmers can sell right there. And, um, 
and, and that is part of, I think, that part of the program or part of the efforts that help to make ag sustainable in our in South County. Uh, I'm glad you, 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 you're talking about sustainability um, because one of the things I think uh, th that's problematic to me is that n nobody really knows some of the gems that we have in South County. And so how are we um, really letting people know about some of these farm stands, about, not exactly, but th the wineries, but, uh, you know, there's that could be problematic too, right? If we're promoting wineries, but there are wineries out there. There's beautiful wineries, there are beautiful farms out there. And as we're coming into this fall season, there's also a lot of like apple picking kind of thing happening, you know. Um, and I, I went to the Farm Bureau last week, I saw um, each other out there, and uh, I think I, I, I think it, I can't remember what what fruit it was, but there was some like come and pick your own fruit, and I think if I wasn't driving past there, I don't know how I would learn and know about these things unless I was a local, and to me it is it is a, such an opportunity for our children to connect back with not only our land but the the cycle of food and appreciate where um, our fruits and vegetables are coming from so that we don't actually throw them away so easily when we're, you know, we discount sometimes um, because we have them so conveniently at our fingertips. And so is there something that we are working on to, to enhance, to, to inform our public, to really promote what South County offers? Hello there, I'm Joe Devaney, Agricultural Commissioner. And on that question there, um, one of the persons who got an award at the event we went to is the Boninos, and they actually created the County Crossroads, which is a mapping system that is advertised online. So uh, that does exist, and it has all the different farm stands and, and the different uh, agritourism sites that you can visit to do the you know, pumpkin patches and the different UPICs and things that you mentioned. In addition to that, though, in 2019, when we pr produced our Valley Ag Plan, um, there's a whole section in there that one of the recommendations was to have a better marketing or branding of our area. Uh, of the 12 recommendations, I think that one wasn't one of the ones that was, you know, a high priority, but it's, it's there and there are some topics and concepts. Um, so I think now with the Ag Liaison, we might can bring that back up. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some really nice ideas about uh, you know what you know language to use or what um, you know Santa Clara Valley or you know South County. There's different even angles to try there. So there's there's stuff thought about, but but kind of left alone for the moment. Well, let's pick it back up, Joe. I, this is exciting to me. I mean, I just I, I think it's wonderful work that you're doing. It's um, patient work um, as you're seeing some of the the fruits of your labor. Um, uh, coming through not only um, through our farmland, but of course the appreciation of of, of that um, in our communities. And as I'm seeing master gardeners and growers and composters, I just appreciate all of that. I, I'm really grateful for all of the work that you're doing. And I know it's a lot of really difficult work. So thank you so much. I don't have any more questions or comments, but um, and I'm happy to support. And I think I've already seconded that motion. So if we could go in to our county clerk and roll call. Vice Chairperson Smidian. Aye. Chairperson Arenas. Yes. Motion passes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. So we're going to go to our very last item. Wait. Four, five. Which is our supportive Housing Dashboard Homelessness Prevention and Reentry Report. Welcome. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Catherine Kaminsky, Deputy Director with the Office of Supportive Housing. I'm joined by my fellow Deputy Director, uh, Hillary Armstrong. Today we have a, um, a few slides um, that include some highlights from our Supportive Housing Dashboard as well as 
uh, two supplemental reports uh, this month. The first is the on the homelessness prevention system. The second on our reentry housing programs. So first we want to highlight um, a few um, updates on our progress towards our community plan goals. First, uh, we are almost 60% towards our goal of housing 20,000 people by 2025. That represents uh, over 11,800 folks who have been uh, placed in permanent housing since the start of the community plan. We also have a goal to reduce our inflow, that's people experiencing homelessness for the first time um, by 30%. Uh, this month, um, uh, we are at a 15% reduction since 2020, so on our way, but still have uh, more progress to make towards that goal. Uh, this is our regular report, our regular chart that shows our monthly inflow versus placement. So this here, we keep a uh, close eye on these trends, understanding that what we're looking for here is eventually to get to a point where we're placing more people into housing than are becoming homeless for the first time. We currently see a ratio of about two to one with um, about two, two households becoming homeless for the first time. Um, versus one household being placed into permanent housing. Um, but we are steadily uh, placing about 150 to 200 households into, into permanent housing every single month. Next, a few highlights on our homelessness prevention system. Uh, first, I uh, wanted to share the annual capacity. So we currently have a capacity to serve almost 2,000 households per year. Um, this does uh, vary a bit, um, and we track it very closely because, of course, the, the, the capacity of this system is um, linked to the funding we have and the amount of funding um, uh, or financial assistance that we're regularly providing to the households. This includes both our homelessness prevention system as well as our emergency assistance network. Uh, both of these types of programs um, are a network of partners operating uh, similar types of assistance, but the homelessness prevention system does provide, a, tends to provide a little bit longer term over the course of a few months, and as you'll see in future slides, uh, a little bit more financial assistance than the um, EAN program. The outcomes for both of these overall remain very positive. We have, uh, we see 95 to 97% of the households served remain housed uh, while they're receiving assistance and over 93% in the HPS and 99% in the uh, EAN programs exit, uh, when they exit the homelessness prevention system um, and EAN program are permanently housed. One of the things we, we include in the report and track very closely uh, over time uh, is the reasons that people are asking for assistance. So we're looking uh, here to understand the types of assistance that can help prevent homelessness. Um, we assume many of these reasons are likely similar to the reasons people who are experiencing homelessness for the first time could be similar to the, those causes. Um, could very consistently, the top reasons uh, that people are requesting assistance through uh, a prevention program are for income loss, they lost a job, some benefits ended, or income reduction, where they may have a reduction in work hours, for example. Some of the other common reasons include a medical emergency, um, changes in family composition, there's a death in the family, divorce, et cetera. These charts um, in Appendix G include the types of assistance provided. Um, and here, again, the two um, different types of programs, very similar in the types of assistance, um, but the HPS program does tend to provide a little bit more on the financial assistance side. Uh, but most commonly, uh, we are providing rental assistance um, and security deposit, uh, as well as uh, motel stays uh, for, for many of the households being served. And the last couple of slides here are showing the demographics of the households that are served. Um, this is uh, for the, the head of the household. Um, we included household type, so you'll see that um, we're serving majority of families with children, but also serving um, 
uh, adult couple households as well as single adult households. Uh, in terms of the age of the households uh, served, it, we do serve folks across, um, um, you know, from 18 to, to seniors, uh, most common in the 25 to 54 range. And then lastly, um, our systems serve approximately 70% female and 30% male head of households. In terms of race and ethnicity, um, we see that approximately 60% of the households we're serving are identify as Hispanic or Latinx, uh, 56 to 60% white, 13% black, African American, or African. And I'll just note that you'll see both here and in the reentry slides, we we see a significant number of folks where it says data not collected on the race. Um, and that's fairly common for folks who identify as Hispanic or Latinx not identifying a race. These questions are asked separately. So in all of our demographic reports, um, you will t tend to see that. And then moving on, just a couple of um, slides on our highlighting success um, of our reentry housing programs. First, um, this slide is demonstrating the housing or showing the housing status of the clients uh, accessing services at the reentry resource center. So this is similar to the reentry uh, reports that you you will have seen in other areas and is pulled from their dashboard. But this helps us understand of those individuals that are showing up at the reentry resource center. What are how many of them are um, experiencing homelessness? And over the last year. 37% of uh, the uh, folks accessing services at the RRC are literally homeless, meaning they're staying in a shelter on the street um, and uh, demonstrating the need for, for housing programs to serve this population. The, this report is focused on the reentry housing programs, meaning the programs that are set aside for this population, but I just wanna note that individuals with criminal justice system involvement are served across programs throughout um, our housing system. So our, for our program outcomes, we highlighted two of the programs that are set aside um, for the reentry population, and that is our rapid rehousing program. Uh, here we see a 70% uh, exit to permanent housing. So this is when folks, when the assistance ends, 78% of the households that are being served when the assistance ends, exit that program uh, as permanently housed. This is significant across our system. It's a 74% um, outcome. And so it shows the uh, success of these programs because it often is the case that folks with recent criminal justice involvement have an even have even higher barriers um, to housing. For our jail diversion, permanent supportive housing program, pension, uh, I, we included the annual retention rate here, which is 97% of the folks being served in that permanent supportive housing program remained housed. We also have a reentry emergency assistance program, which is shorter term, one-time financial assistance. Um, and here, uh, we're just showing how many people have been, um, how many have been served, um, and the amount of assistance in each type. Uh, the majority here, 57%, are rental assist, are receiving rental assistance um, or security deposit assistance, um, and about 35% motel voucher assistance. Lastly, um, uh, the demo, we included the race and ethnicity of the folks that are um, assessed at the, at the reentry center. Uh, so these are the, uh, similar to that first slide where we looked at the entire population of those who are um, unhoused and assessed um, at the reentry center. And we see about 48% identify as white, 14% black or African American, 6% American Indian, Alaskan Native or Indigenous, and um, the ethnic, in terms of ethnicity, about 51% identify as Hispanic or Latinx. And with that, um, Hillary and I are available to answer any questions about the report. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna look at our clerk for any speakers online or in person. We have no speakers uh, in this room or present. Excuse me? 
We have no speakers in the Zoom room or physically present. In oh, I'm papers. sorry, I didn't catch that last part. I changed my word, sorry about that. No, 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 <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And I don't see a light, so um, for my vice chair, so I'm just gonna go, go ahead and ask some questions. I really appreciate the, um, highlighting some of the, the, the dips in the homeless prevention, um, um, well, at least the, the the need is higher, but the capacity is is not where it, I'd like to see it, and I know I'm sure you where you would like to see it as well. Um, and so, what what is it that um, what kind of strategies? How are we how are we responding to that need um, in order to increase uh, the enrollments to the homeless prevention? Thank you for the question, Chairperson. Um, you know the the slight reduction in the capacity for the homelessness prevention system does represent that uh, not a reduction in funding over the past year, but that many of the families um, are needing more assistance in the recent year um, versus previous years um, to in order to stay housed. So um, higher amount of rental assistance, which just means of people there is a much greater need than we're able to serve. So we are uh, consistently looking at grant opportunities um, or any other funding um, partners. Uh, this is a system that is supported with funding, not only from the county, but the city of San Jose, as well as Destination Home, um, and continually looking to, to increase that um, via any revenue source that, uh, for which homelessness prevention services are eligible. Um, I, I would really be interested in, in having an offline conversation about some of the philanthropic organizations that are invested in this area. Obviously, you've already mentioned some of them, um, but there's also a lot of businesses that um, get impacted by um, our unhoused community, and I I believe they would they would want to support a further. Um, uh, they would want to help prevent some of the uh, additional um, homeless uh, homelessness that's happening within our county. Um, and so I think if we haven't seen them in the, in the same light before, I think um, certainly different than what they normally have. Um, and I think they may be in a, have a different um, willingness to participate. Um, and so I, I'd love to see how we can we can t maybe uh, posture ourselves in, in order to um, leverage those conversations. Um, so I, I would appreciate that, and we can do that offline. Um, so we're we're seeing less families, but um, they need more more of our funding. Um, and that is absolutely concerning because we know that the need is is great, right? Um, and so um, I'm not sure what further plans there are for, for financial assistance. Are we going to stay with this kind of framework where we're providing longer and more additional funding um, and just serving less families and less individuals? Yeah, th thank you, Chairperson. Um, I we do want to make sure that the level of assistance we're providing results in a positive outcome. So I think it is a balance between serving, really being a prevention program, it is one time and shorter term assistance um, and, and making sure that that assistance is enough to keep that family or that individual housed, um, but not becoming a two, three, four year program where they may need a different type of program. Right. So we do plan to continue to provide this this slightly, possibly two or three months assistance if that's what it takes to get people housed because it is still much more cost effective than right. it is to serve them if they became homeless. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so our systems are really, I see you are shifting and, and I think that we're gonna have to really shift in, in order for um, further to further prevent homelessness for, of families and individuals that find themselves in this position because I, I, I can't imagine that in a couple of months people are just standing on their own. So they are, they are also pivoting and I don't know what they're pivoting to and so I'd love to see what, what that looks like in real time. Um, obviously on, in some parts of our, 
of uh, our county, especially in my district, um, in the district I served as a council member, there's just a lot of families living together, right? And then that poses risks to our children and just other different dynamics. Um, and then so we're creating um, scenarios that are going to require some additional investment, um, either in the moment or down the road. Um, and so knowing what we know, how, how are we being responsive to, to, those strat to, to those dynamics and what is happening? And I'll just, um, for the sake, and I know you, you already know this, but I'm just gonna state this. Um, 95122, which is in my council district, it was in my council district, um, is the same zip code as, um, has the same amount of people as the whole city of Gilroy. And that one zip code, right? Um, and so people are really just uh, using single family homes as dense, dense housing, right? Um, and we know this. And so knowing that, I think, um, get, uh, puts us in a position to be responsible, to also provide some of those peripheral um, services that are going to prevent abuse, um, uh, or, and that uh, may offer um, our children an opportunity to be in a safe space and to continue their learning and not be disrupted. Um, as well as, um, in, you know, in this I just actually, I heard this week because I went to my, my dentist office and she was talking to me about how she was going to sponsor a dinner for um, a local high school, their football team, because there were uh, quite a number of folks who, of kiddos there that were um, unhoused. And and, it, and uh, she told me how they were just pulling together, the community was pulling together. She, this was her alma mater. Um, and so she just had a close connection with this particular high school. And how um, just those folks who are able to, you know, to provide uh, dinners for the whole team, because of course they don't want to single anybody out, before games and before practices because they want to make sure that they're fed and that, um, and that they, they can participate in a sport and not compromise their, their, their physical selves. And, and it made me think about the last item that we were talking about um, in terms of, you know, there's a lot of fruits and vegetables and food in, in general that is available to our residents and our communities and our families. But what is also shifting is that availability of our parents. Um, and we're kind of falling back to a, a bit that we saw back in the 90s where there's a lot of latchkey kids, right? Um, and, and we know this. And so despite having a, a lot of fruits and vegetables and, and food in, in your pantry, um, if you ask most kids, they don't know how to put it together. And so how do we work with like the, the, the folks who, who were here before you and the item before you, there's food available. We know that. We're, we're actually working within that um, field to make sure that there, are, there is food available on the table. But it doesn't mean that our kids know how to feed themselves because that's where, how they find themselves that's where they're finding themselves now, alone at home or in a room, renting a, a three-bedroom house, um, but, it, but sequestered into a room. And how do we, how do we um, provide some additional support for those families and for those children and those teenagers to make meals for themselves? Because we know that's their reality. Right, I'm, and I, we can't just say, well, well you, you know, we're gonna get them CalFresh. I don't, I don't wanna hear that, oh, they, they're not enrolled in CalFresh. Well, they can get three, two meals at school. Um, I've seen those meals and um, I don't know that I would continue with the third meal um, coming from those schools, um, or any school, not one in particular, but most schools. 
And how do we build the capacity for our kiddos and our families to survive this? Not, not just with our housing, um, but with all the peripheral needs that individuals, children, and families um, require. Um, because this is, we are seeing a, a real shift, right? I mean, you're telling me what you're doing in order to address what is happening, right? So we're, we're, we're supporting people longer and, for, and with more additional funding. And then what, how are we being comprehensive about the needs of those families? And I know that it's not always you as a house in the housing department responsibility, but it is our responsibility as a network to work with one another to figure, to make sure that, you know, we, you, you know the families that are struggling, so how are they being supported comprehensively, and I know there's a lot of coordination already, and there's a lot of networks, but the reality is that our, our kids out there are just not being supported in the same way that they should be, and I know for a fact that our young Latinas, brown, and, and, and probably all those who are under um, reporting in our Asian community as well, are being sexually assaulted. Last 10, 12 years, numbers go up, and especially under the age of 13. And so this picture, we, we, you see, you see, we see the picture um, only through the eyes of housing, only through the eyes of um, you know, agriculture, only through the eyes of social services, only through, and, and, but yet there is, there is this one family that has all of these issues um, that is the same family regardless of whatever system they're in. And so we have to really think about, and I want us to start thinking about how we are comprehensively supporting. And I'd like to take this conversation offline because I do think that there's an opportunity for us to work with um, uh, some of the, the programs to make sure that we are building capacity within those families and sustainability um, for years or uh, much less um, um, on an ongoing uh, uh, basis. So, so anyways, I, the, a long way for, uh, for me to say that I, I want us to, to think about the item before us, how, how is that item, how can we um, make sure that we partner with what they're doing already? We're not gonna reinvent the wheel, but making sure that we build capacity within the families that we know are just struggling. So anyways, um, I'd like to make sure that we have that discussion offline. I'll go ahead and make a motion to, um, no, you know what, I'll ask my vice chair. I, I don't want to take this, this privilege many times, um, so if you could. I believe the only recommended action is to receive the multiple reports. I'm happy to make that motion, but Madam Chair, if there's any direction you want uh, to provide to staff, or follow up on the, I want to make sure it gets incorporated in the motion. Sure, I'll go ahead and, and add if we can um, have a, a follow up um, meeting and plan on how we are integrating um, our, in, our food production and local um, agriculture with, with and building capacity for our families um, to actually uh, build meals um, and not just have food in inside their home. So uh, just building a partnership with um, with the programs that came in item six. Um, Happy to incorporate that in the motion. Uh, and thank you for the second, Madam Chair. Second. Awesome. Vice Chairperson Smidian. Aye. Chairperson Arenas. I motion passes. Thank you so much for everyone for being so patient. Um, and I'm going to ask you for some additional patience as we move through our last portion of, of our meeting, which is um, having some uh, staff updates as we go through 
our line here of all of our uh, collaborators. Um, if we can just go through and have a highlights, any invitations, anything that you would like to mention. And if you could please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Jacqueline Anshano, Director of Planning and Development. Just a brief update on what's happening in the Department of Planning and Development. We are working diligently, and this is a highlight for us, so stabilizing our workforce. Um, as you know, we were operating at a 25% vacancy rate. We are down now to 11%. We're very excited about that. We have added many new staff. Um, to our team, and we're, we're quite excited about that. And then we're processing, currently processing our um, an update to our housing element and the Stanford Community Plan that will be moving forward to the board October 17th. And so we are um, excited to be bringing that forward for consideration. And then we are also working on addressing our development fees. Um, this is, we've just commenced this work. We'll be working with uh, OBA. Uh, and so um, those are our highlights. And just day to day, we are working with the residents of the county and, and serving them in the processing of their permits. Those are the highlights. We have many large projects that we're working on, but just giving you a quick sound bite of, of uh, what, we're, um, what we're working on. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Harry Freitas. I'm the director of the Roads and Airports Department. Uh, just a summary of some of our activities really um, this year uh, to date. At the airports, um, activity strong. We got about 90,000 um, operations uh, so far this year at Reed Hillview and 50,000 at uh, South County. Uh, those will hold um, uh, steady for this year at uh, 150 um, and um, and about, uh, uh, excuse me, 90,000 respectively in those two airports. Um, on paving, uh, we're doing 83 miles this year um, of surface treatments, contractually and in-house, and we'll complete our goal of 83 miles, keeping us on our seven-year schedule. In traffic, um, daily trips on the expressways are at 1.3 uh, million, which is um, still 300,000 down from our pre pandemic uh, daily trips on the expressways and on the capital side um, right now we have three bridges under construction two on Uvis one on, on the Alamitos Creek and um, we have 33 sites that uh, uh, we're working on in terms of storm damage we've completed some of the critical work in the Santa Cruz mountains we're moving over to the um, San Antonio Valley um, and the East Hills um, prior to the commencement of the rainy season. And that conclu uh, concludes our report. Through the chair. Yes, yes, go ahead. I'll try and do this quickly. I work to date on the storm damage uh, issues, particularly I know progress is being made. Also want to thank you for the monthly status reports. Those are frankly um, very helpful, both for my office, but also for the affected residents. Uh, I do want to verify and I'm taking this opportunity in a public meeting to verify that our prior Board of Supervisors action did in fact provide the necessary funding and contracting authority and that it's sufficient for the work that you need to do. Yeah, we're, uh, yeah, uh, thank you through the chair, um, Supervisor Simidian. Uh, your actions um, specifically regarding the monitoring of Aldercroft Heights Road, monitoring of Clayton Road, uh, allocating $15.4 million for the storm damage and some additional direction on noticing in the uh, San Antonio Valley, uh, two-week noticing for road closures. We're following up on all of those. Um, we're going to reopen Clayton Road actually in the next two weeks. It's an interim opening. And we plan on reopening Aldercroft Heights. Uh, this is not the permanent repairs. Um, we're gonna plan I'm sorry, to this is not what? Through the, the permanent repairs. Got These it. roads, those two roads have significant deep-seated landslides, as you know, we're all aware. We've been reporting on that. Uh, but we have enough geotechnical engineering information to op reopen those roads safely in an interim condition, one lane in each direction. So Clayton is going to be in the next, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm leaning in. Clayton will be in the next two weeks or so. We'll, we'll open Clayton. That's in the East Hills. And um, Aldercroft will be prior to uh, the start of the rainy season, which is really October 15th. I don't have a firm date on Aldercroft yet because I'm still waiting for some geotechnical information. 
Um, then the other direction was, so you asked us to monitor those two and see if we could reopen them in an interim condition. As I said, we're moving over to the San Antonio Valley. We're gonna do some repairs out there with the proper two weeks notice as requested by uh, Supervisor Lee, um, and those aero boards have already been placed. Um, and then I don't believe, and then the 15.4 million, um, we're not at the point yet where we can say that that isn't sufficient, but we are monitoring the expenditures very closely and we will come to the Board of Supervisors prior to uh, the need, with ample time prior to the need for additional funding. Thank you, through the chair, um, I, I did, you, I think you anticipated my concern. I just wanted to make sure we didn't suddenly find ourselves delayed for two or three weeks between meetings because the funding wasn't there and what I'm hearing is, so far the funding is there and if at some point that becomes an issue staff will be mindful of the need to get to our board for authorization sooner rather than later and not impede progress yes yeah, that's correct yeah. old santa cruz highway yeah old santa cruz we're going to uh, provide um, overwintering um, uh, hardening essentially we're not able to repair that road yet we're still working on permits from the resource agencies including fishing game excuse me, Fish and Wildlife, Army Corps, and Regional Water Quality Control Board. So Old Santa Cruz will remain closed over the winter. Um, as you and your office know, that there are um, ample and sufficient um, alternate routes, albeit not in, you know, not the most direct. Um, however, um, we, um, are, uh, we are gonna be overwintering that site without repair. Yeah, I think, um not the most direct may may get the award for understatement of the day, uh, but uh, I take I take your point. It, the situation is what it is. Um, I just want to indicate, uh, you know, my my office is uh, or my office is con you know continues to be available to help get information out to the community because uh, you know there are some things that are just not physically practicable, um, doable. And uh, the only thing that makes it worse is when the community feels like they are either getting no information or misinformation. So anything we can do to work uh, with getting the information out, please, um, please ask. And uh, yeah. it, it, anything we can do to do Aldercroft Heights sooner rather than later, that one's really a tough one, as you know, in terms of community impact. And uh, we'll look forward to getting a date from you. And if you can provide that to our office off agenda, when you ha think you have something more precise, that would be appreciated as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, we'll do on that note. Uh, we will be, we are actually in the process of preparing notification in the Santa Cruz Mountain area of our progress. We're gonna send that through the Loma Prieta Community Foundation's um, uh, mailing list, which is actually quite an effective way of communicating with both the Santa Cruz County side and the Santa Clara County side. Uh, and we'll work, we'll work with your office on that communication. Um, that'll, that'll let them know how the winter is gonna go on those road repairs. Thank you very much. Thank you, let's keep moving down the road. Don Rutchett, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, we're winding down our busy season, so our public programming um, is starting to wind down and now we're starting to amp up on our school programming, um, including our Alviso boat tours. Uh, they are continuing up until around fall when the when the bay becomes a little bit more challenging for us with the tide. It's, uh, we've conducted a 280-acre prescribed burn at Grant Park um, earlier this year, and we're working with CAL FIRE um, in another joint effort to do another prescribed fire um, in October, about 100 acres. The department kicked off its DEI organizational assessment project. Um, so we've reached out to community members, CBOs, and others to kick that project off. So we're really looking forward to that and the outcomes um, for equitable ac access within the park system and really learning from others. Uh, we're uh, transitioning also into preparing to be, to, uh, for the fall and the winter season. So our maintenance staff have started to work on cleaning culverts and other elements to, in our trail systems to prevent erosion and other slides and impacts to our trail system. Um, we have a couple of fall events occurring in, in October. We have the Alviso Day on the Bay, October 14th, and October 7th, we have the Marshall Cottle Fall Festival. Um, uh, we've also launched a new volunteer Adopt-A-Spot program, so we're really excited about that to give uh, community members an opportunity to engage in the park system and adopt an area to help us maintain and um, uh, advocate for that area. And then finally, we are kicking off, our in October, we're kicking off uh, 
a fields management project at Mount Madonna County Park. And that ends my report. Thank you. Edgar. Never had to say this, but good afternoon, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Smitting, uh, SEPA Director Edgar Nolasco. So I will do a brief overview of SEPA activities. Uh, I'll start with vector control. Um, we're reviewing our notice, noticing procedures for adult mosquito control treatment as it relates to our referral to the hospital and health committee. Um, vector control has proactively notified um, the public. As of today, we have sent out 78,000 postcards, 87,000 emails, 26,000 alert SEC notifications. And what we're doing different now is we're proactively notifying folks sooner rather than later. That includes city managers and city councils. Um, for the season as of right now, unfortunately, we are experiencing a higher than usual season for West Nile virus. We have had 13 adult mosquito treatments as of now. Uh, knock on wood, it's been two weeks and we haven't found any, so they've been effective. Uh, and those 13 uh, adult mosquito treatments affected about 78,000 parcels and around 33 square miles of our county. In the Integrated Waste Division, SB 170, our county-wide litter abatement program, uh, and partnered with the San Jose Conservation Corps, we have done 363 locations of cleanup. Uh, they have picked up 48 tons of trash and debris and have completed around 12,000 hours um, through the Corps. In the Ag Division, it's, uh, if all of you have been aware, the Ag Oriental Fruit Fly Quarantine is in full effect. So our Ag Department, our Ag Commissioner, is working with closely with CDFA and USDA um, to ensure compliance with the agreements as it relates to the quarantine. Uh, and the happiest news, I finally met our canine dog team. We have an Ag, a functional Ag dog team now. Uh, canine Everest. She's a female black lab. She's very sweet, very good at her job. And we're very pleased with her handler, Jana, and our team. And they're a great partner. They've been hitting a lot of targets at our, at our facilities. In the Animal Services Division, um, I am happy to report that we have our second veterinarian, Dr. Kramer. She comes all the way from Australia. Um, and she's being onboarded. She started this week, so we'll be full um, fledged with our our services at the Animal Services Center. Um, also, intake for the Animal Services Center is uh, up 35 percent as compared to last fiscal year. Uh, we can expect that we will have around 50 5,500 uh, animals this year, which is higher than last year because we typically have around 3,000 to 4,000 animals annually at this shelter. Um, and last but not least, in our, eight, eight, our Household Hazardous Waste Division, uh, we had 37,000 appointments last year and collected 1,200 tons of waste and just about 8,000 pounds of unwanted medical um, supplies and 4,800 pounds of sharps. And that concludes my report. Wow, that is quite a bit. <laughs> All right, last but not least. Good afternoon, Chairperson and uh, Supervisor Simidian. Um, uh, Catherine Kaminsky, Deputy Director for the Office of Supportive Housing. Um, I wanted to share uh, some updates on our current lease-ups. Uh, this is a very busy time, thanks to the board support um, and Measure A. Um, we're seeing uh, many of these developments open. Villas at 4th right now is um, in the process of le leasing up. 93 of the 94 units are now leased up at Villas on 4th. Uh, Agrihood Senior Apartments is a 165-unit senior affordable and supportive housing development. Um, there was a grand opening yesterday um, uh, that was a great event, and is we are currently leasing up the 54 units of supportive housing there. Sango Court Apartments in Milpitas is a 102-unit affordable and supportive housing development with uh, 44 units of supportive housing that we are currently filling uh, as well. And then lastly, we are in the process of leasing up Emmanuel Sobrato Community, uh, which is 106 units of supportive housing, uh, 61 of which are, sorry, yeah, 61 of which are filled. So um, very busy, um, 
you know, dozens of folks getting housed uh, each week at these developments, um, which is great news. Um, I also want to share that our administrative our grants and contracts team is busy um, uh, working to uh, submit a 33 million, over $33 million in grants. This is our annual continuum of care competition, which is a community effort. Um, I like to mention it because it takes many, many partners, our nonprofit um, agencies that are very involved in this process. It is not just a uh, county effort, but rather a community-wide effort um, and that we are very successful because of those partnerships that we have in the community. We do this annually um, and in, in are consistently able to increase our revenue uh, to support these supportive housing programs. Lastly, we are in the process uh, of our um, request for statements of qualifications for all of our basic needs and temporary housing programs. Um, so the uh, application period is complete. We're in the process of review and uh, we expect to select a qualified pool of providers for temporary housing of basic needs uh, for which um, the board will see um, several agreements um, to operate those shelters, outreach services, interim housing um, in the coming year. End of report. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, Timing, if you know it on development partner for West Valley Educator Housing. Uh, sorry, Supervisor, I do not know the answer to that, but I can I can follow up with Consuelo and and get back to you. Thank you. Could I ask for an email directly to me today on that subject, please? Not because I have any concern, but just because I'm wanting to know and I'm getting questions because of the interest that's out there, and. Um, Uh, I think that's the only question I have for today. The others are too long. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, well, that um, concludes our committee. Thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. And to the chair, just confirming we had no speakers on item numbers 7 through 11. Thank you.